Welcome to the fourth video in our series focusing on the health of your prostate. In this video, we will look at the various tests used to diagnose prostate cancer, and ask the important question, whether you actually should take such tests? This is a highly controversial question, and we want you to be aware of the different points of view. But, before we start, we would like to ask you to do us a big favor. You may not know it, but because of the way YouTube works, the more subscribers and thumbs up we get, the easier it will be for other viewers to find our channel and our videos. So, if you find our videos helpful, please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. It will really help us. Thank you so much. Now, that being said, let's start. It is a fact that if prostate cancer is found as a result of screening, it is likely that it will be at an earlier stage than if no screening were done, and that the cancer therefore would be more treatable. This might lead you to think that prostate cancer screening would always be a good thing, but please be aware that there are important questions surrounding screening that make it unclear if the benefits of early screening really outweigh the risks. Now, let us ask why many doctors now struggle to decide whether or not to recommend screening for prostate cancer. The first reason is the possibility of what we call overdiagnosis which might lead to actions that are not really necessary. The fact is, even if screening detects prostate cancer, your doctor might not be able to tell if your cancer is truly dangerous, and if it really needs to be treated. You might think that finding and treating all prostate cancers early would make sense, but please remember that some prostate cancers grow so slowly that they would never cause you any problems during your lifetime. So what happens if you because of screening may be diagnosed with a prostate cancer that you would never have known about without the screening, and that would never have led to your death, or even caused you to feel any symptoms? This is what we call overdiagnosis because it is finding a disease that would never cause any problems. So, now you can see that the problem with overdiagnosis in prostate cancer is that you might still be treated with either surgery or radiation that you don't really need, either because your doctor can't be sure how quickly your cancer might grow and spread, or because you yourself will be uncomfortable knowing that you have cancer and that you are not getting any treatment. This is why treatment of a cancer that would never have caused any problems is known as overtreatment. The problem with this is that even if they weren't needed, treatments like surgery and radiation might be carried out, often resulting in severe side effects like urinary and sexual problems that can seriously affect your quality of life. Surely, this may make you stop and think. Let us now consider how to react if you actually have been tested and cancer has been diagnosed. If you and your doctor are struggling to decide if you need treatment, or if your cancer can just be closely watched without being treated right away, we want you to be aware of an amazingly positive approach that we call active surveillance, or watchful waiting, that will lead to no treatments and therefore no side effects. In the next video we will look in more detail into this positive approach. It is also important to know that the tests used in testing for prostate cancer often are inaccurate and therefore might give unclear, or even false results. This is because neither the blood test that we call the PSA test, nor the doctor's rectal exam, when he uses his gloved finger to feel the prostate, the so-called DRE, is 100% accurate. It is not unusual that these tests can give a positive result, indicating that you have prostate cancer, even when you do not have any cancer at all. This is what we call a false positive result. You might be shocked when we now tell you, that if you had sex during the 48 hours before the PSA test, your test result would most probably be much worse than if you had avoided sex before the test. So, knowing this, you would be well advised to come back next week, to make a new test, this time with no sex prior to the test. Imagine, if your doctor had told you to make a biopsy based on the first test, how you would feel if you later had been told about this basic, but mostly unknown fact. Now, let us move on and consider how you would react if you get a negative test result that suggests that you don't have cancer, but in fact, you do have prostate cancer. Needless to say, a false negative can give you a false sense of security, even though you might actually have cancer. As you have seen, you have to think very carefully, and know your personal risk factors, before you make the decision on whether you should test for prostate cancer or not. We hope you have watched the third video in our series on the health of your prostate, where we looked into the various risk factors of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. As we have seen, there are many factors to take into account, including your age, health, family history, and ethnicity. For example, if you're young and in a high-risk group, 
you may want to test for prostate cancer because, if you have it, it may shorten your life if it's not caught early. On the other hand, for men who are older or in poor health, testing for prostate cancer is less likely to help them live longer. This, of course, is because most prostate cancers are slow-growing, and men who are older or have major health problems, are more likely to die from other causes before their prostate cancer grows enough to cause major problems. Now it is time to look at the various tests in more detail. First, the controversial PSA test. The PSA blood test is used mainly to screen for prostate cancer in men without symptoms, but it's also one of the first tests done in men who have symptoms that might be caused by prostate cancer. The name PSA comes from the prostate-specific antigen, which is a protein, made by cells in the prostate gland. In some countries, like the United Kingdom, PSA tests are not routinely offered to screen for prostate cancer, because the results can be unreliable. Please remember this, because if you are told to take a PSA test, you need to be aware that a PSA blood test is not specific to prostate cancer. Your PSA level can also be raised by other conditions, that have nothing to do with cancer. One example, as we have seen, is that if you have had sex a day or two before the PSA test, the result may be considerably higher than your normal level. This is because PSA is found mostly in semen. There are also a number of other factors that may influence the PSA test results. This means that a high PSA level cannot tell the doctor whether you have a life-threatening prostate cancer, or not. However, the PSA test can be very useful if you have already been diagnosed with prostate cancer. This is especially true if you have been diagnosed with a slow-growing cancer, that made you choose what we call active surveillance, or watchful waiting, instead of surgery, radiation or hormone treatment. You will learn more about active surveillance and watchful waiting in the next video in our series on the health of your prostate. So, you may ask, what do we measure with a PSA blood test? A PSA blood test measure the presence of prostate-specific antigen in units called nanograms per milliliter. The chance of having prostate cancer goes up as the PSA level goes up, but there is no set cutoff point that can tell for sure, if you do or don't have prostate cancer. Many doctors use a PSA cutoff point of 4 nanogram per milliliter or higher when deciding if a man might need further testing while other doctors might recommend it starting at a lower level, such as 2.5 or 3. It is a fact that most men, without prostate cancer, have PSA levels under 4, but still a level below 4 is not a guarantee that a man doesn't have cancer. Men with a PSA level between 4 and 10, that is often called the borderline range have about a 25% chance of having prostate cancer. However, if the PSA is more than 10, the chance of having prostate cancer is over 50%. So, if my PSA level is on the high side, what will the doctor do? This is when your doctor will want to do a digital rectal exam, often called a DRE. This he will do by inserting a gloved, lubricated finger into your rectum, to feel for any bumps or hard areas on the prostate, that might be cancer. If the results of a PSA blood test and the DRE suggest that you might have prostate cancer, your doctor will most likely tell you that you need a prostate biopsy. In a biopsy small samples of the prostate are removed so that they later can be studied under a microscope. During the biopsy, the doctor usually looks at the prostate by the use of ultrasound or MRI when he quickly inserts a thin, hollow needle into the prostate to take small samples of tissue from your prostate. When the needle is pulled out it removes a small core of prostate tissue. Your doctor will do this several times, usually he will take about 12 core samples from different parts of the prostate. This sounds painful, you may think, but just relax, each biopsy usually causes only some brief discomfort because it is done with a special spring-loaded biopsy instrument that inserts and removes the needle in only a fraction of a second. Before the doctor starts the biopsy, he will numb the area by injecting a local anesthetic alongside the prostate. The biopsy itself takes about 10 minutes, and is usually done in the doctor's office. Your biopsy samples will be sent to a lab, where they will be looked at under a microscope to see if they contain cancer cells, and if so, what grade the cancer will be given. So, after a biopsy, the result will be given as either positive for cancer, that is when cancer cells were seen in the biopsy samples, or negative for cancer when no cancer cells were seen in the biopsy samples. 
The result may also be reported as suspicious when something abnormal was seen, but it might not be cancer. It is important to know that even if many samples are taken, biopsies can still sometimes miss a cancer, if none of the biopsy needles pass through it. Again, this is known as a false negative result. Now let us look at what is called the Gleason score. We use the Gleason score to grade the levels of cancer from the biopsy cores. If the cancer looks like normal prostate tissue, a grade of 1 is assigned. If the cancer looks very abnormal, it is given a grade of 5. Almost all cancers are grade 3 or higher, grades 1 and 2 are not often used. Now it gets a little bit complicated. Since prostate cancers often have different areas with different grades, a grade is assigned to each of the two areas with most of the cancer. These two grades are added to yield the Gleason score. The first number assigned, is the grade that is most common in the tumor. For example, if the Gleason score is written as 3 plus 4 equals 7, it means that most of the tumor is grade 3 and less is grade 4, and they are added for a Gleason score of 7. Based on the Gleason score, prostate cancers are often divided into three groups. Cancers with a Gleason score of 6 or less may be called low-grade. Cancers with a Gleason score of 7 of may be called intermediate-grade. Cancers with Gleason scores of 8 to 10 of may be called high-grade. However, please be aware that prostate cancer outcomes can also be divided into more than just these three groups. In what we call grade groups, the cancer is ranged from 1, which is a cancer that is most likely to grow and spread slowly, to 5 which is a cancer that is most likely to grow and spread quickly. Finally, let us briefly look at imaging tests that are used to detect and measure prostate cancer like x-rays, magnetic fields, sound waves and radioactive substances to create pictures of the inside of your body. The imaging tests used most often to look for prostate cancer spread include transrectal ultrasound, which we call truss. For this test, a small probe about the width of a finger is lubricated and placed in your rectum. The probe gives off sound waves that enter the prostate and create echoes. The probe picks up the echoes, and a computer turns them into a black and white image of the prostate. This procedure often takes less than 10 minutes and is done in a doctor's office or in a clinic. You will feel some pressure when the probe is inserted, but it is usually not painful. Newer forms of truss, such as color Doppler ultrasound, might be even more helpful in some situations. Then we have magnetic resonance imaging, that we usually just call MRI scans. MRI scans create detailed images of soft tissues in the body by the use of radio waves, and strong magnets. MRI scans are very useful, because they can give doctors a very clear picture of the prostate, and of the nearby areas. If a prostate biopsy is planned, an MRI might be done to help locate and target areas of the prostate that are most likely to contain cancer. As we have seen, MRI can also be used during a prostate biopsy, to help guide the needles into the prostate. If prostate cancer has been found, MRI can help determine the stage of the cancer and show if the cancer has spread outside the prostate. This can be very important for men who have chosen active surveillance or watchful waiting as MRI helps in determining if your prostate cancer is spreading and you therefore should consider other treatment options. In the unfortunate event that a prostate cancer has spread to distant parts of the body, it often goes to the bones first. A bone scan can help show if cancer has reached the bones. For this test, a small amount of low-level radioactive material is injected, which settles in damaged areas of bone throughout the body. A special camera then detects the radioactivity and creates a picture of the skeleton. Even though a bone scan might suggest cancer in the bone, to reach an accurate diagnosis, other tests such as plain x-rays, CT or MRI scans, or even a bone biopsy, might be needed. Finally, let us look at computed tomography that is more commonly known as a CT scan. A CT scan uses x-rays to make detailed, cross-sectional images of your body. This test isn't often needed for newly diagnosed prostate cancer, if the cancer is likely to be confined to the prostate, based on other findings like the DRE result and PSA level and the Gleason score. Still, it can sometimes help tell if prostate cancer has spread into nearby lymph nodes. 
If the prostate cancer has come back after treatment, the CT scan can often tell if it is growing into other organs or structures in the pelvis. We hope this video has helped to answer some questions you may have had about testing for prostate cancer. If you want to receive notifications when we make more videos available here on our YouTube channel Men's Health and Wellness, please click subscribe and the bell. If you have found this video helpful, it would also be nice if you could give it a thumbs up. As we said at the beginning of this video, the more thumbs up we get, the more viewers will find our channel in their search for better health and wellness. Finally, we want to remind you that in the next video we will look at active surveillance and watchful waiting. Thank you so much for watching. We hope things will turn out well for you, and we wish you all the best.